Amen. Remain standing. We ask you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, the very first book in the New Testament. We're looking at Matthew chapter 1, and we'll be looking briefly at verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 1. Verses 18 through 20. The word of God reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. For your consideration, we'll be looking at the type of the profile of a godly father. Amen. You may be seated. The profile of a godly father. First of all, I want to thank God for this opportunity to be in the house of worship once again. God did not have to let me be here, but he did. And not only did he allow me to be here, but he has given me the opportunity and the privilege to be able to stand before his people today to talk to you about the profile of a godly father. And we want to thank God for our senior overseer, Pastor Michael. Thank God for his leadership. Thank God for his ministry. Thank God for the vision he's given to him as our overseer. We want to thank God for Elder Brook, our worship leader, Fireball, got things going and kept it up there. And we thank God for Sister Blevin, Beautiful song, Falling in Love with Jesus. If you have not yet fallen in love with Jesus, you are missing out on the best thing that could ever, ever happen to you. When you fall in love with Jesus, your whole outlook changes. Everything about you will be different because you will see things from a different perspective. Falling in love with Jesus. Thank you, Sister Blevins, for that. Minister of Music. Thank God for everyone that's here that make of the body of Christ. You did not have to come, but you pressed your way. We thank God for you. Thank God for our mother of the church, Mother Mary here. Praise God. Praise God. She reminded us in our hymn, I need thee every hour. And Lord, I'm standing right here. I need you, Lord. I cannot do this without you. I need you to strengthen my body. I need you to just take control and help me to let go. So I need you, Lord God. And we thank God for all our deacons and deaconesses and all our elders, uh, Elder uh, Monica and Elder Sorrell, and, of course, we already recognize Elder Brooke and everyone that are here. So we thank God for you. And I want to say happy Father's Day to each of you, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Give yourself a hand clap of praise. Thank God for that privilege he's given you. Everybody are not fathers. Everybody cannot be a father. A godly father, that is. But we want to say a happy father to all the dads in the house. And the idea of a national observance of a day set aside to honor fathers soon followed the effort of in the 1900s to establish a National Mother's Day. Prior to that, obs observance of such days as Mother's Days or Father's Days were done by churches or communities. Mother's Day received the recognition by joint resolution of Congress on May 9th, 1914, with it becoming an annual national observance of the federal government in 1915. Over the years, many resolutions were introduced into Congress to recognize Father's Day in a similar way, but it did not become an official annual federal holiday until 1972. Some may say, wow, 57 years for that to happen? It took one year for Mother's Day? It took 57 years for Father's Day to become a national holiday? 
But this fact should not be taken lightly because Satan knows that uh, every man that takes full responsibility for their actions and their deeds and decisions and then accept God's given right to become a godly father living accordingly, Satan would no longer be able to destroy your family. God has given mankind the authority and power to rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus. And Satan must flee. Satan cannot tarry in God's presence. Godly fathers, you got the power to put Satan to flight. You don't have to take nothing from Satan. Satan is under your control if you are a godly father and lying in your life of the will of God. You got power. You got clout. God was not confused when he made man the head of the family. Nor was God confused when he said that man must leave his father and his mother cleave to his wife, that is, a woman and not another man. According to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And not only that, God blessed and com- commanded them, that is, a man and a woman, to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth and to subdue it. Only a man and a woman can uh, honor God's command. Two men can't be fruitful and multiply. Two women can't be fruitful and multiply. God was not confused when he said a man was to leave his mother and his father and cleave unto his wife. God was not confused when he said the man was to be the head, was to be the provider, the protector. God was not confused. God gave dominion to them the man and the woman, to Adam and Eve over the earth, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, 28. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Congratulations, godly fathers. God has appointed and ordained you to be the head and not the tail. You, as a godly father, you are to love, cherish, respect, adore, protect, provide for, and to lead your family into a holy relationship with God. Can I get a witness? Godly Father, while it's nice that the nation attention, that the national attention is given to this important order and event, honoring mothers and fathers, but I want you to know God's command to honor parents go back to the Ten Commandments. The fourth, I'm sorry, the fifth commandment out of the ten, as penned in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, tells us we ought to honor our father and our mother. We ought to honor our parents. And it's not just limited to one day in a year. Jesus repeated this command in both Luke chapter 18, verse 20, and Colossia chapter 3, verse 20. And also Paul repeated to the church in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, noting that it was the first commandment with a promise that it might be well with you and you may live longer on the earth if you honor your father and your mother. If children, if you want to have a long healthy, prosperous life, honor your parents. That's a promise from God. There are short graves out there because so many of our children have failed to honor God's commandment to honor the parents. There are children that get bad enough to raise their hand to attack their parents or talk back disrespect, rebel to a pair, you're cutting off your life expectancy. God said it. I didn't see it. God said that we were to honor our parents. No matter how old we get, they're still our parents. When we get old and gray, if God still have our parents alive, we're still to honor our parents. We don't have a license to do otherwise. Now, it may be difficult for some to do this 
because of your relationship or your upbringing. All of godly fathers did not come up in a godly home. All of our godly fathers did not have a good example. Some uh, ex uh, presence, some memory of father is a very painful experience. But I want you to know that it doesn't have to be like that for you and your children. I'm here to serve fathers notice that God is holding you responsible for your family. He's not holding your wife responsible. He's not holding your children responsible. He's not holding what your past was or what somebody did you in the past. He's not holding those things responsible, but he's holding you responsible for your family. God is calling for fathers to return to their rightful place in the home, their rightful place in the church, in the community, in society at large. Godly father can no longer stand at the back of the land. I'm, I'm sorry, of the line. You can't stand at the back and expect to be the leader. You can't stand on the side, looking at your side, your eye, waiting, watching, wondering what your wife is going to do, asking for permission. You are the head. God expects fathers to move to the front and take care of of their family by trusting God to lead, God to guide them and to direct them in the path of righteousness. Everything that their family needs, God has already provided. It is now time for godly fathers to take the leadership role and lead their family into a righteous relationship with God and with one another. It's too long have father and son been at bickering with each other. Too long have father and daughters been angry with each other. Too long have father and mother been going at it in front of the children or in the back room. Too long God is saying that you, father, are responsible for your family. Yeah. Abundant blessings will follow when you line up with God's will. As family, especially fathers, line up with God's will for the family and our individual lives, we can be confident that God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You will find yourself totally amazed how the blessing keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. Even though opposition is coming against you, even though your mind can't conceive of it, even though your body may not be able to even understand it, but God said when you line up with his will, when you do what he say, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. Today, I want to talk to you men, both those that are already fathers and those of you who will be fathers in the future, which includes our young men, about how you can make sure that your children can joyfully and easily obey God's command to honor you. See, God didn't give the children a choice. God told the children to honor their parents. But fathers, you have a very important role to play. It's your job to make sure that that is an easy task for your children. And God wants us to realize that he's there to help us. He was there to help you fathers to be a godly father. So the question is, what is a godly father, and how can you be one? We must first get a common understanding of three important words in this topic. Profile, godly, and father. Profile is defined as a sad view of an object or structure a representation of an object or structure seen from the side. So, in other words, this profile, whatever the godly father is, they're going to be able to see from a profile, from an object, from a view of what a godly father is really all about. Now, godly is defined as having great reverence for God or having a religious character, pious or devout. So you put 
profile and Gala together, you're getting a little picture here, but we got to bring this word father in you to have a clear picture of what it, uh, what it means to have a profile of a godly father. Now, father is defined as a male parent or any male acting in parental capacity. Has to be a male to be a father. Can't be another woman to be a father. Uh, you know, I'm just saying what God said. Now, God didn't give two women to be parents. God certainly did not give two men to be parents. He gave a man and he gave a woman. The word let us know that he gave man first. And then after man had seen everything and named everything, and it's still that to this day, then Adam realized that he didn't have a man. So God, it wasn't an afterthought. God just wanted to really let that be inked in his mind. And then Adam realized he did not have a mate. So God, out of his love and mercy, he performed the first surgery that's recorded in history. He put Adam to sleep. And then he got the rib from his side. He didn't get a bone out of his head. He didn't get a bone out of his foot. He certainly get a bone out of his back. So that means we women, we don't want to be walking behind them. And we don't want to be in front of them or over them. We supposed to be beside them. And then he gave him woman. And I like to say, when Adam looked and saw Eve and saw how beautiful she was, he said, wow. That's why I said woman. You look at that first. He, 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 he wasn't confused neither. He said, they got something. Look what I have. Yeah. So, so you put it together. A profile of a godly father. That means we're going to see a, a preview, a side view. We're going to see a representation of what it means to be a godly, a religious, a pious, devout father. And this father has to be a man, has to be a male figure that's providing for his family. Now, if we look, take this closer look at this, we must realize that in order to really understand what is the, the profile of a godly father, this father must resemble the almighty father, which means this father must be a godly, godly person. And if you look with me in Psalms 1, we will gain an understanding of godliness by both what he does not do as well as what he does. Psalms chapter 1. Turn that with me. I want you to be taking my word for it. I want you to read it along with me. Psalms chapter 1, starting in verse 1. God's child wants us to understand his expectation and definition of a godly father. The word says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, for in his law does he meditate day and night. A godly father shall be like a tree planted by the river water that bringeth forth his fruit in season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Yes. A godly father. So as we look at a godly father, we realize that he must, first of all, find himself enjoying God's presence. And a godly father must walk not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standing in the uh, way of sinners or cities. In other words, he does not take his counsel from a wicked person. He avoids evil. A godly father is not afraid to cry out to God, the almighty father, for help. See, a godly father is not afraid to realize that they don't know everything. You know, I, I know our father want to be muncho and superman and, and know all things and know everything and see no evil and do no evil. But a godly father will admit that they don't know everything. Yeah. 
And they are not afraid to cry out for help. Amen. A godly father, if you're looking at a godly father, the hallmark of godliness is being controlled by the spirit of God. And when you talk about being controlled by the Spirit of God, you have to look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where it lists the fruit of the Spirit. And if a godly father has love in his heart. A godly father has joy in his heart, even when things may not be so pleasant because he's a godly father, because he has already asked God for help, and God has already told it's done. He can, he can have joy in his heart while he waits upon God to manifest what he's already said. A godly father can have peace, can have patience. A godly father must be kind and must have goodness in their heart. And a godly father must be faithful, must be faithful to God, must be faithful to his family. A godly father is gentle and has self-control. See, a godly father is not afraid to be gentle. You know, some men think they got to be this muncho and won't cry and won't shed any tears and got to be so stern and everything. But a godly father don't mind smiling. A godly father does not mind playing with the children and getting down, getting their hands dirty and, and doing those types of things. And then even when some come against you, you still have self-control. But I submit to you, a lack of the fruit of the Spirit is almost always accompanied by an increase in some of the deed of the flesh, which includes, and this is shown in Galatians chapter 5 also, but these are the first one listed in verses 19 through 21. Let's us know about immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, dispute, dissension, fraction, envy, all these things, drunkenness, reveling, and things of this nature are things, uh, uh, these things should not be part of a man that, quote, says here, Godly Father. In fact, I will stand to tell you that they will not be a part of his character because a godly father has the fruit of the spirit. And these things are not part of the fruit. Therefore, they will not bear on your tree. Godly fathers are strong and not afraid to show love. A godly father is a man that walketh not in the counsel of evil. A godly father delights in the law of God. He meditates day and night. In other words, he's talking about this godly father will find himself knowing that the law of God is perfect. A godly father knows that the law of God is sure, knows that it's right and pure and clean, and knows that it's true. Therefore, uh, he knows that the word of God will restore him where man may have tried to tear him down where maybe circumstances have come against him and unjust things have taken place that may try to destroy him, but the word of God will restore him, will build him up. The word of God will make him strong. The word of God will make him wise. The word of God will make that godly father rejoice. The word of God will enlighten that godly father's eyes. That godly father will be able to look at a circumstance, a situation, and be able to understand what he's dealing with and be able to make the decision that are wise, even though sometimes we as wise who also God, we may may not see it just the way they see it, but because God had made that man the head and he has lined himself to the will of God, he's now honoring God and preaching him an example, God will open his eyes and that godly father will be able to see what we cannot see with the natural eye. And as we review the profile of a godly father, we must go to the ultimate source of knowledge. And Elder Monica even mentioned in her prayer, the word of God lets us know that God is all-knowing. So if anything you want to know, go to God. Go to his word, and you will find an answer there. No matter what it is, no matter how difficult it may seem, no matter how impossible it may look, when you go to God who's all-knowing, he will always give you the right answer. So as we seek and clear understanding of the profile of God the Father, we must turn to God, and God will give us the right attributes, the characteristics, and the profile of a godly father. We, as earthly parents, would not entrust our children to someone who's almost straight. 
or someone who's almost religious, or someone who's almost good. You wouldn't give your child to somebody who's almost straight. Because you know if you take your child to a person who's almost straight, what's going to happen? Well, God, the Heavenly Father, would not do anything less. So since we are trying to understand a godly father, I will encourage you to turn with me as we look at uh, Jesus, earthly godly father. We're talking about God having all answers. So God would not entrust his only begotten son to any father that were not godly. Would you agree with me on that? Amen. Amen. So if that be the case, we should be able to learn quite a bit from Joseph, Jesus' earthly, godly father. Our key scripture came from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And we learn from that passage of scripture that Joseph was formally engaged to Mary when she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, in those days, betrothal was more than today's private agreement between a man and a woman to be wed. We call it engagement. But Troth and Joseph and Mary's time was a formal binding contract with specific rights and responsibilities. When Mary turned up pregnant, Joseph would have been within his rights under Jewish law to have Mary charged with adultery and stoned to death. Instead, he chose to marry her and accept legal responsibility for the child she carried. What a noble and loving act. In other words, Joseph's role as protector saved both Mary and her unborn child. Now, under the Jewish law, death was inedible. Because historically context, this was an unusual action on Joseph's part because the Jews kept strict control over sexual relationships for the purpose of assuring the purity of their bloodline. And if we look at the Gospel of Matthew, we see that Joseph struggled with what to do. He loved Mary, and the word says that he was not willing to make a public example. So he had made his mind to put her away privately. And in, in, in the old days, not like that now, but when, uh, when we were growing up, when a child, a young woman got pregnant, was not married, they were sent her off or to some of the people in another part so most people around wouldn't know that she's pregnant. And when, when the baby was born, a lot of times the mom and the child come back, but the parents raise a child as if it's their child. So that child grow up thinking their mother really their sister and thinking that the parents are really, the, the grandparents are really their parents. So the, it was really, really a big thing for a woman in that day and time to come up pregnant and not be married. And Joseph, because he loved Mary, and because he was concerned about her, he didn't just want to make her a public example and, and, and uh, call it like it was and say she uh, accused her of being an adultery and have her stoned to death. So he was, had already decided to put away privately. He was just trying to figure out just how and when to do it. And, and, and that's why I say, God, if Father can make a decision, but while you are praying and seeking how to do it, God will reveal the right choice and the right plan of action to you. But if you are godly, then you'll be able to recognize God's voice and follow therefore. So that's the case here. When God came to Joseph with the angels, told him to fear not, the word said, but while he thought on these things, verse 20, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So this brought peace to Joseph's mind. And because Joseph was a God-fearing man, because Joseph was a righteous man, and because Joseph was a loving man, he married Mary. 
he married her. And then he went on to take care of her. So we learn from this gospel that Job was faithful, obedient servant of God, and he did just what God said. And then when God, when time came, God sent him to Egypt to protect his wife and his son from an insecure, evil king named Herod. And fathers, as you draw nigh to God day by day, he will warn you. He will guide you through the danger that may be there to harm your family, and he will preserve you and your family. A godly father will stand up against Satan and launch a counterattack to protect and to guide his family to safety. Now, since we ask God for what it is, what it means to be a godly father, we want to look, take a, a deeper look at Joseph. So we're going to look at a profile on Joseph, who was Christ's earthly father. God, not man. That's important. God chose Joseph to be the earthly father of his only begotten son. Yeah. What an honor. Yeah. What an honor for any father. Of all the men in the world, he chose Joseph to be his son father. Father has a very important role to play in a child's life. Father impacts that child's outcome more in some ways than that mother. Yes, God made us to be the nurturer. We are the one that do a lot of the nurturing and looking at men and taking care of them. But that attitude, that way in which that father carries himself, the disposition of that father influenced their whole household. If that father is a God-fearing man, that father is humble, that father is meek, and that father is kind and gentle and loving, then that whole atmosphere of the house will be different. But if that father is an introvert and won't talk to anybody and mean and grumpy and do things without the consulting his family, then that house is going to be a wreck. That marriage is going to be in trouble. And it's really something to have another man over your child. God looked down through 42 generations and he said Joseph was going to be the one to be the father for my son. Now God said, I don't need Joseph to help in the conception of my son. We got that covered. Because see, man couldn't have anything to be with that part because Christ had to still be divine. He had to be holy, pure. And the bloodline comes from who? The father. So if Joseph had conceived this child with Mary, then that bloodline would not be the same it is with the Holy Spirit overtaking Mary and she conceiving that child. But God trusted Joseph, a righteous man, to rear his son. Those first 12 years of a child's life is very, very important. Now, I'm sure it's a desire of all fathers to see that children grow up and have their own family. But if you are not afforded that privilege, but if you are able to be there when they're first conceived all the way up to 12 years, you really have laid the foundation and they got something to build on. Because you studied the word of God and, and, and that came out in the scripture reading over there in Luke chapter 2 where uh, Jesus, when he became 12, they took him to the uh, Passover with them. See, the word of God lets us know. If you look at over there in Luke chapter 2, it was telling us about how Joseph and Mary, the parent of Jesus, they took Jesus to the temple there in Jerusalem for his dedication according to the ceremony law that was given by God. And they took him there to the temple. And while they were there, Anna, a prophetess, she saw this child. 
And because she was a woman of God, she recognized that Jesus, even though it was nothing but a baby, that he was the Messiah, the one that had been prophesied, the one that had been promised to come. Uh, Anna, who was a devout woman of God, she lived in the temple, not come by there. She was there day and night serving God, people, ministering, praying, meditating, doing whatever she had to do at the temple for 84 years. In the temple. She only had seven short years to be married. And then God saw fit to let her husband die. She could have become bitter. She could have become angry. She could have become blamed God. As so many people do when God lets my die untimely. People turn from God and begin to hate God and get angry with God and blame God. But she did not. She was a devout woman. She was a godly woman. And she spent her life there at the temple serving God. And when God gave her that privilege to see his only begotten son, she recognized who he was. And then she began to rejoice and she prophesied over Jesus. Oh, Joseph and Mary heard that and they kept those things in their hearts. And the word of God lets us know that as every year the custom, they would go to the Passover festival. But when Jesus became 12 years old, the word of God let us know that they took him with them then, and this time on their way back home, they didn't realize when they started that journey that Jesus was not with them. For the word says that Joseph nurtured along with Mary and trained Jesus. And the child grew strong. The child waxed strong in his physical and in intellect and his spiritual strength. And he was filled with wisdom. And I believe in the word of God by Joseph being a righteous man, a devout man, a gentle father, that he taught his son by precept and example. And, and we all know that Joseph Trey, his occupation was a carpenter. So a carpenter uses their hand. They, they are skilled in, in wood and other things. And I want you to realize that fathers today, I submit to you, you too must be carpenter. Like Joseph, fathers, you can mentor your son or your daughter. You can mentor your friend, your relative. You can teach them the skills of passing their faith on to generations after them. The more we learn about our faith, the better teachers we'll become. Faith to love and to give wholeheartedly. Faith to trust God and to stand against sin. Faith to discipline with love and righteousness regardless of what the government say. Faith to be a godly dad praying and teaching your children to love and to trust God rather than to conform to the world. Faith to be a godly man when it's unpopular to be godly. Faith to lead by precept and example. And I submit to you there are examples throughout the word of God of people who had faith that was willing to lead by precept and example. As we look at the profile of the godly father, uh, we, it will reveal to us that Joseph trusts God rather than himself and anyone else, including his wife, unlike Adam, who trusted Eve yes. over God. The profile of a godly father shows us that we must cling to God no matter what. We can look at Noah, who stands out among the fathers in the Bible, a man who cling to God in the midst of wickedness, in the midst of all the evil that was going on. Noah cling to God. Noah obey God. And that's so relevant to us today in a world so full with evil, in a world where the world is saying what is right is wrong, what is wrong, right. We, godly father, the we children of light, we got to stand up. Because, because God is giving you, Father, the responsibility to protect your family, you got to know when to stand up, you got to know when to be humble, and you got to know when to fight. But you also got to know when to take flight. Today, Father, often feel that they are thankless. They have a role that nobody would thank them or appreciate them until they need something. 
But God wants you to know that he's pleased with you being a godly father. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you may not get the many kisses and the hellos and the text messages the mothers get. You may not even get the nice gifts like the mother get. But God is pleased when you are standing up for righteousness. Yeah. God is pleased when you stand before your family and let them know this is the way it's going to be because this is what the word of God says and we together going to stand in the Lord and we're going to trust God. And then you begin to love on your wife. You begin to love on your children. Don't be afraid to hug them. Don't be afraid to caress them. Don't be afraid to talk with them, to play with them, to visit with them, to spend time walking and just getting to know what they, what's on their mind. Talk to them. Listen to them. So often we as parents, we have all the answers. We do all the talking. And the children just with nothing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we wonder why our children don't say anything. We don't give them a chance to say very much because we're doing the most of the talking. We are preaching to them rather than listening to them. And I have to watch myself on that too. But as we continue to ask God, what is it to make a, what's the profile of a godly father God wants us to know that a godly father trusts and have faith in God's word. Just like Abraham. Abraham was given a severe test, severely tested above most men. But he passed the test. And because of Abraham's faith and loyalty to God, he became the father of an entire nation. He was a leader with tremendous faith, passing one of the most difficult tests ever given to man. Abraham made mistakes. Yes, he did. But God the Father trusts God rather than themselves. And Abraham trusted God will give him a ram. Abraham believed that God had given him this son in his old age. And when God says, offer him up, Abraham was willing to do just that. God the Father, you got to be willing to let God be the first no matter what. No matter how your wife fuck, no matter how your children get upset, no matter how we stick our lips out. If you are God and you stand on the word of God, you got to be a not afraid to stand because you stand on God's word, God will bring us back where we need to be and we'll be on one accord once again. Fathers, you have an incredible opportunity before you. You can teach it your incredible lessons by your behavior. Imagine the life that Isaac would have had if he didn't have a father like Abraham to do what he did. Abraham was, I mean, Isaac was an obedient son, and Isaac learned what it means to trust in God. Fathers, if you trust God and do what is right, you trust God to lead you and to direct you, trust God to manage your finances, trust God to manage your home, trust God to give you wisdom on how to deal with matter, God will teach you, and as God is teaching you, your children are learning from you. Unfortunately, we're teaching our children a lot of time. We don't realize we're teaching them. Just like David. David had to fight the Goliath in his life. And we all have Goliath. We all have giants. But David, because he trusted God, because he had a loving relationship with God, he was not afraid to go up against the Goliath that came up in his life. And I want you to know, Father, there are things going to come up against you. There are things going to come up against your marriage. There are things going to come up against your health. There are things going to come up against your family. There are things going to come up against your job. Don't be afraid to trust God. And just like God gave David the victory over that giant Goliath, God will give you the victory. If one door closed in your faith, don't don't be afraid because God is saying, I got another path for you. And he's just preparing you to be able to walk down that new path. It may look like the door been closed. It may look like your opportunity is gone. But I want you to know if you are a godly father, if you're standing up on God's word, if you're lining your life up and humming with God, divine will, God will not forsake you. God is able to take away in order to bless. See, God mass is not like our man. One plus one is two, but God sometimes has to take away in order to build up and to multiply and increase. I want you to not to be afraid to trust God. God the Father cares. God intervenes in our lives 
through prayers and godly father intervenes in the lives of their family through godly wisdom and faith in God's word. Praise God for God-fearing fathers who seek to follow Jesus and to leave their family to God. Just like God the Father has triumphed over Satan, despite Satan's evil influences in the world, he is a defeated foe. I want you to know that Satan is already defeated. God's final victory is certain. So if you, God and Father, land yourself with God's will, God will give you the victory. Just like Joseph, Joseph believed and trusted God, and he married, uh, married, and God blessed him. Just like Joseph believed in God, he was obedient to God's command, God and Father must be obedient to God. God has made you the head and not the tail. God has said that he's going to bless you. God has said that he's going to never leave you nor forsake you. So God God and Father, I want you to believe in God's word. God's word is a love letter to you. God's word is there to tell you no matter what come against you, I will not fail you. What come against you, I will not forsake you. What come against you, I will not turn my back on you in the midst of your deepest mess, even when you don't understand. God is saying to you, God and Father, today, trust me and I will work it out. God is saying, even though you can't see how it's going to work out, trust me and i turn it around. God is saying to all the God and Father in the house, don't be afraid to show your children that you love them. Don't be afraid to acknowledge that you don't know all things. Trust God and he'll make it clear to you trust God and he'll give you the wisdom you need trust God he'll give you the strength you need to be able to stand up when the Lord of the world is coming against you when everything is going south and you don't understand trust God because he will not let it crush you trust God he's gonna let you walk through the fire but a flame won't kill against you trust God he will not let the water overtake you even though you may have to go through some red sea experience but I want you to know as a God is Father, you can trust God. When your wife don't understand, don't be afraid to trust God. When your parents don't understand what you're doing, don't be afraid to trust God. When your boss man or boss woman threatening to fire you because you're trusting God, don't be afraid to trust God because God said that he would never forsake you. God said his eyes are upon the righteous. God said his ears in tune you your cry. So if you cry out to God, God will hear your cry. If you believe in God, God will make that thing right. If you need God to turn the world upside down to make sure his standard is hell or hell, then God will do it. The key is, thank God for God fearing Father. And if you don't have a father here today, then you still, if he's gone to sleep, thank God for that father that you did have. If your father is resting in his grave, thank God for giving you a God fearing Father. And if your father is alive, make sure you connect with your father and tell your father that you thank him for doing what he did for you. Thank your father for showing you how to love. Thank your father for showing you how to become a man. Thank your father for what he did and the sacrifice he made. So whatever is going on, even you and your father is estranged with each other and can't quite see eye to eye. I want you to make it a country decision that you're going to fall on your face to the Lord and ask God to reconcile that relationship because God is not pleased with any father that is not reconciled with him first and reconciled with his family. So God wants us to understand that the profile of a godly father is to love God more than anything. The profile of a godly father is to obey God and to Trust God. The profile of God the Father is the fruit of the Spirit being manifest in their life. And then they're walking by faith and not by sight. Trusting God, holding his standard, doing what is right. The profile of a godly father.